So we are going to talk about the power method for computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, in the last video, we talked about a direct approach for figuring out the eigenvalues of a matrix. But in that case, we were looking at a two by two matrix, which is kind of like the baby case. If we want to use eigenvalues in real world applications, a lot of times we're going to be looking at things like 200 by 200 matrices. And if we want to find the eigenvalues directly, that's going to take a lot of time and computation. So sometimes it's better to know numerical methods for computing approximations for eigenvalues, and that's what the power method is. Now, for the purposes of this video, we're going to assume that our matrix A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. So what this means is that, for example, a 2 by 2 matrix would have two eigenvectors, or a 3 by 3 matrix would have three eigenvectors, so an n by n matrix is going to have n linearly independent eigenvectors, and those are going to go with n eigenvalues. And it's possible that, for example, lambda 1 equals lambda 2, but we know that the eigenvectors are going to be different. Now, there aren't always n linearly independent eigenvectors, but there are a few ways to extend the power method to those special cases. In this video, we're only going to talk about our general case of n linearly independent eigenvectors. So what this means is that, for example, for a 2 by 2 matrix with two eigenvectors, we can express any vector x as a linear combination of these eigenvectors, just like this. So the reason that this is true is if we're looking at, for example, 2 by 2 space, we know that the vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1 have the potential to reach anywhere in space because we can add them together to get to a particular point. But even if our vectors are something different, like say our eigenvectors, one is down here like this, and one is straight forward, and these magnitudes could be anything we want, we know that we could still get to some other point. Like, for example, this point right here. We could still get there by going negative one times this vector plus two times the other vector. So even though our vectors aren't the normal one, zero, and zero, one, we can reach any point in space using just two vectors. So that's the reason we want n linearly independent eigenvectors. Now here's the reason why this is important. What we're going to do is take both sides of this equation and multiply by a. So on the left, we get ax. On the other side, we're going to get c1. What is a times v1? Well, v1 is an eigenvector. So if you apply the matrix, it has the same effect as scaling it by the constant lambda 1. So in fact, we can completely get rid of the matrix A on the right side and just have lambda 1 v1. Next, we add C2 lambda 2 v2, and we go on Cn lambda n vn. Now what happens if we apply the matrix again? Well, then we get A squared x on the left side, which just means we apply the matrix twice. Then on the other side, C1 lambda 1 is again a constant, so we don't have to worry about that when we're multiplying by the matrix. And then we're get, just going to get lambda 1, and then lambda 1 times v1 again. So we get lambda 1 squared v1. Then c2 lambda 2 squared v2, and all the way up to cn lambda n squared vn. And more generally, if we took some power, say to the power of k of the matrix A on both sides, then we would get c1 lambda 1 to the k v1, and so on to cn lambda n to the k vn. And this is because we are able to write any vector as the sum of eigenvectors that gets scaled like this. Now once we get to this point, we're going to look at something called the dominant eigenvalue, which just means the eigenvalue that has the biggest magnitude. So for example, if the eigenvalues were negative 2, negative 1, and 1, negative 2 is the dominant eigenvalue because it's the biggest one out of all three numbers. And we're just going to assume that lambda 1 is the biggest eigenvalue. Because these numbers don't really mean anything, we could flip them around. So lambda 1 is the biggest. What we're going to do is factor out lambda 1 to the k on this side of the equation. So if we factor out lambda 1 to the k, this first term just becomes c1 v1. If we look at the second term, well, that was c2, and then we had lambda 2 to the k v2. But we factored out lambda 1 to the k. So we're actually going to have lambda 2 over lambda 1 to the k. And this way, when we multiply by lambda 1 to the k, we get back what we started with. 
And this continues until we have cn lambda n over lambda 1 to the k vn. Now the reason that we were looking at the dominant eigenvalue is because since lambda 1 is bigger than all of the other lambdas, these things inside the parentheses are all going to have magnitudes less than 1. So what happens if we take something smaller than 1 and raise it to some positive power that we keep increasing and increasing? Well, then we're going to get some kind of decay towards 0 as we increase the power. So if we iterate enough times, a to the k, a to the k plus 1, a to the k plus 2, and we keep going and going, all of these parts are going to disappear as they go towards 0. And all we're going to get left with as we increase the value of k is c1 lambda 1 to the k v1, just this first part, because everything else starts approaching 0. So what this means is that just by taking some random vector x and applying the matrix A over and over and over and over again, we will eventually approach an actual eigenvector of the matrix A, which is pretty awesome. Now, obviously, we don't want to keep multiplying by the matrix A over and over by hand. That takes a really long time. So in this case, this would be something you would do in Excel or MATLAB or something like that. One thing to note if you want to apply this method is that usually the problem with this is if your eigenvalue is greater than 1, then this term is going to start blowing up to infinity as you multiply by a over and over again. So your eigenvector is going to be something like 1 billion, 3 billion, which is kind of annoying to deal with. So we want to keep our vectors nice and small. What that means is let's say we pick the initial vector 1, 1 for our x, because we can pick anything we want. What we would do is let's say we multiply by a, and it turns out to be 2, 1. And that's what we got. What we would do is say, OK, this got bigger. We're going to scale it down by the bigger one of these two values here. So in this case, 2 is bigger. So we would just scale it down to 1, 1 half. And then if we apply the matrix again and say this time we get 0.63, in this case, 3 is the biggest number. So we would scale it down by 3. So we're always just making sure that the biggest component of our vector is 1. And that way our vector doesn't have the problem of blowing up too big. And that's a relatively easy computation to perform in between the matrix vector multiplications. And remember that once you have the eigenvector, it's very easy to find the eigenvalue, because we know that a v equals lambda v. This is the definition of an eigenvector. So if we just take our eigenvector and multiply by the matrix one more time, however much it gets scaled, that lambda value is our eigenvalue, which makes that very easy to compute. So we are able to use the power method by taking some random vector x and multiplying by our matrix over and over and over again. Eventually, it approaches an eigenvector that corresponds to the dominant, the biggest eigenvalue of our matrix. And in the next video, we'll talk about how to find eigenvalues besides the biggest one.